Welcome to episode 19 of Escape the Rat Race Radio. I'm your host, Christian Rodwell, and this is your ticket to escape the nine to five. How interesting is it that as you go throughout your life, unless you have the benefit of a great coach who teaches you something like that for sport, you literally can go your entire life and never ask yourself, how do I win this game? This game of 28,900 days, statistically speaking, that is life. And if you never ask that question, odds are you will not win. You'll get to the end and you're gonna be one of the people who ends up with regrets. And that's really sad. And so one of the core things that I teach at the Big Five for Life is not getting caught up in what I call mad how disease. How do I do this? And that keeps people from taking that first step. And so the question is never how, the question is who, who's already done it? And look at what process they took and then just imitate it. Welcome to part two of my conversation with John Strelecki. I hope you caught part one last week where we found out from John really where everything began in terms of his inspiration and actually going into what he called a conscious stream of just writing, which was resulted in his first book. In this second part of our conversation, we talk a lot about the power of having a mentor, how that can really speed up your journey. We also talk about ways to really understand what it is that is the right path for you. And and the clues can be found in your hobbies as to what you would spend the majority of your time doing if you didn't have to get up and go to work every day. So let's not waste any time. Let's move straight into part two of my conversation with John Strelecki. We hear, in fact, again, I'll refer back to John, my, my mentor, who always says, you know, it begins with asking yourself the question, what does winning mean to you? And we often hear about what is your why? What's your purpose? Your passion? Your vision? Different ways of explaining it. But ultimately, it's just about getting really comfortable about who you are and what you want out of your life, isn't it? Yeah. So I, a couple of things in there that I love. One is I just had a conversation yesterday, actually, with someone about how, and she's an athlete as I am, and we're saying that when you're an athlete, your life as it relates to sport is focused on how do I win? And and, and sometimes that's how do I win the match or the game, but sometimes it's how do I win and the winning is I wanna do better than I thought I was capable of doing. And so in sport, you're constantly thinking about that so that you can then adjust your strategies and your workouts and your eating habits and the rest of that to make sure that you give yourself the best shot possible at winning. And so we were talking yesterday and I said, how interesting is it that as you go throughout your life, unless you have the benefit of a great coach who teaches you something like that for sport, you literally can go your entire life and never ask yourself, how do I win this game, right? This game of 28,900 days, statistically speaking, that is life. And if you never ask that question, odds are you will not win. You'll get to the end and you're going to be one of the people who ends up with the regrets. And that's really sad. But if, you're allow, if you allow yourself to ask the question of how do I win the game of life for me, it opens up a, a series of doors and passageways and thought processes that really enable you to live your life in a way that you are out of the rat race and in alignment with who you are and what you're doing. And it's so different. It's just totally different. I wish it was taught in school. I mean, like every kid should have the chance to hear that. And you compare it there to sport, which, which is, is so true. The best, best sports people in the world have coaches. And yet most others don't. It just seems crazy. And we talk about it so often on Escape the Rat Race Radio, the importance of having a mentor who can shortcut the journey for you. Someone who's already walked down that path a few steps and can guide you and, and show you how to avoid the pitfalls and just keep you accountable and keep nudging you back on course. I'm correct to say, I think that the writing of the books has led to so many opportunities for you. And now, of course, you are sharing that through your own mentoring and training programs. Yeah. And let me throw something out to to anybody who's listening in the audience as it relates to that. So I, I grew up in an environment where I knew nothing about mentoring. And although I was an athlete my whole life and I understood the concept of a coach as it relates to sports, I didn't make the connection between that and life, you know, when I was younger. And so there was that aspect of it. I think if you grew up in a family where your parent or, you know, like a trusted source can guide you on that process. That's fantastic. But I'll tell you what my other issue was. I didn't have the self-confidence to interact with someone who was a mentor. Like I was very, like I said, like I didn't grow up with much money and like I was working these crappy jobs. I didn't have the greatest self-esteem. And so the idea of exposing all of those vulnerabilities to someone else was horribly uncomfortable. 
I just didn't have enough sense of self that I could have been comfortable doing that, which is an absolute travesty because that is the time when, when you need it the most. You know, that's when you're about as low as you can go in this game. And you're just trying to improve your speed by one tenth of a tenth of a percent. You might be able to figure that out on your own. But when you're at the bottom just starting, that is when you really, really need a coach. And so for anybody who's listening to this who might be resonating with that concept, like, man, I just don't feel like I feel comfortable sharing my story and my lack of achievements or my lack of wealth or my lack of shoes that even fit me um, with someone else. Let me tell you, people who care want to work with people who want help and who are motivated and driven, but just don't know the way to go from point A to point B. Like that is what fills our soul. (laughs) And I am not one of those people. And I will tell you, like that is when my heart catches fire is when I meet someone and I say, oh my God, that's me 20 years ago, 25 years ago. You know, if only I'd have known then what I know now. I want to help that kind of person. And so if you're that kind of person and you're feeling self-conscious, allow yourself the freedom to at least have that initial dialogue with someone who could be your mentor, who could be your coach, who can take you where you want to go. Because as you just said, Christian, that is a thousand times faster than uh, maybe a million times faster than having to figure it out on your own. Indeed. So John, would you mind telling us a little bit about the certified coaches that that you now have and the 3,000 or it may well be even more than 3,000 clients now around the world that you've helped, which includes adults and teenagers and, and organizations as well? I started sharing the Big Five for Life concept in my speeches. It then became the basis, obviously, of the Big Five for Life book, since it's called the Big Five for Life. And I included it when I wrote the book Life Safari 2, but in a very different context. And so it really became the core theme of so much of what I was teaching. And I started to get all these requests from people saying, John, I'd like, I totally connect with this. I resonate with this. So the question is, how do I figure this out? Like, How do I get clear on my Big Five for Life? I didn't know. Like, you know, my, my path was go backpack around the world for a year and you're going to look at everything different. But obviously, that's not the path for everyone. And so I sat down for about two months and I mapped out, again, very stream of conscious, a process of helping someone go from I don't know to crystal clear. I am 100% clear that this is what I want to do soon experience. These are my big five for life. And with nothing more than just sheer, like, I feel this is right. I tested it on a group of 10 people who wanted, who said, we want to do this. I wasn't very good at teaching it because it was my first time. They were very accommodating. And even despite all of my screw ups, it was phenomenal. And I knew like, wow, like there is so totally something here. And that was going back like 12, 12 years ago, maybe. And so I refined it and taught it again. I refined it and taught it again. I refined it and taught it again. And it started to be something so cool, Christian, where like I could, I remember teaching a course and they were translating it from English into German. And then another translator would change it into German, into Romanian. And then the people would actually hear the Romanian. <laughs> and, and they didn't tell me this until I showed up to teach the course, by the way. And I was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like when you do non sign and this was not, um, when you do simultaneous translation like that, like there's, there's a time gap and there's also a translation gap. You know, it's like that game with the, the monkey game, you know, where you're like, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm like, oh my gosh, what are these people actually going to hear by the time they actually, you know, get the voice in their earphone? Despite all of that, it was still life-changing for everybody in that room. And that's when I really realized something. Sometimes you are called to do an activity, a process, to, to share whatever is your thing or to be a voice for something. And you just need to trust the process and step to the side and let it flow. And so I learned that and I did. And so what I started doing is working with amazing people around the world who said, I want to teach this. And so in Europe, I have a business partner who covers all of the German speaking languages. Amazing guy, an amazing coach. And that's all very centralized. I have another team in the Netherlands, another team in in French speaking Canada who covers France. um, So it's been an unbelievable joy. And the catalyst for it was actually realizing I wanted to make a difference. And if I was the only guy teaching, if I was the only guy sharing the message, then there was going to be a serious limitation because I can only be on so many stages at a time. I can only teach so many courses. And also I became a dad and I didn't want to leave as much as I used to go and do that. So I started teaching other coaches and it is just so awesome to see a coach 
have their first big five for life discovery course. And they're so nervous. They're even the most talented coaches ever, like nervous, right? And then I talk to them afterwards and they're like, oh my God, that was so awesome. And they tell me story after story after story. And it's just so cool. So yeah, it's, it's truly an amazing, amazing experience. A couple of times you've referred to, to just taking that first step. And I think that's a really important point. We just need to punctuate there for people. You know, when you wrote your book, you didn't know what the steps were, but you just, you just did it. You just found out and you just did it. You set up the publishing company. Same with your speaking and then same with the teaching as well. And I just think it's such an important point to stress to anybody out there is just taking that first step because you're bound to have some, some ups and downs along the way. It's never going to be perfect. And we know the, the route to success or the road to success is definitely not a straight road. <laughs> There's no, going to no. be some twist, twists and turns. But if you never take that first step and kind of really pushing yourself in your comfort zone, then do you want to be in the same place today in 12 months time? And you have to really ask yourself that serious question. Yeah, I, I will be the first to admit, I have made every possible mistake you can make as it relates to being an author. I have signed stupid contracts because I didn't know better. I've negotiated horrible deals because I didn't know better. But you learn through that. And now I'm much smarter in the process, but I wouldn't have been had I not done that. And so one of the core things that I teach at the Big Five for Life is not getting caught up in what I call mad how disease. And mad how disease is that question that you were just referring to. How do I do this? How do I do this? And that keeps people from taking that first step. And so the question is never how. The question is who? Who's already done it? Who's, who's already five steps farther down the path than you are? And look at what process they took and then just imitate it. And eventually you're going to get so comfortable with the path that you are want to be walking and that you are start that you do start walking that you can continue to imitate other people who are successful if you want, but you can also start to add your own little twist, right? That's what makes it unique. That's what makes it special. And I'll give you a perfect ex example of this where I was completely clueless, but I didn't want to suffer from Matt Howe disease. After my first book, The Why Cafe, had been, I decided I'm going to turn this into a book, right? I'm going to start a publishing company. I'm going to turn this into a book. And so I was like, I don't know anything about that, right? So Christian, here's what I did. I went to my bookshelf. I took out one of my favorite books of all time, a little book called Illusions by an author named Richard Bach. I measured the book, with a little plastic ruler. And I was like, okay, it's four and a quarter inches by seven and a quarter. That's how big my book is going to be. I opened up the book and I was like, okay, the interior margin is three-eighths of an inch. That's going to be my interior margin. <laughs> like, I mean, if you don't know what to do, just imitate someone else until you get your, your sort of your legs underneath you. It makes mm -hmm. life so much easier. You alluded to this a second ago, and, and I think this is a critical piece. I talked about this a bit before, but I will stress it again here in a different context. When you take that first step, it is like saying to some higher power, some force greater than us, you know what? he's serious or she's serious about this because up to that point, it's all nebulous. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. They're interested. They're not interested. So many people sit and they say, I wish I had, I wish I had, I wish I had, but that does not demonstrate to the universe or God or whatever the word of choice is that you are serious about this. I have an expression that came to me, a very powerful moment. The universe is not listening. The universe is listening and watching. And when you take that first step, all of a sudden, it activates something far greater than we can actually conceptualize. And things start happening. You don't take that first step, it doesn't start happening. Another phrase which I often refer to and I think is appropriate now is when the why is strong enough, the how will take care of itself. Yeah, exactly. And, but, and there's a piece of that. Like I've known people who have a very big why and they're sitting at their desk, right? The, the why is there. But they are not doing what you said. They are not taking that first step. They are where they want it. They are where that's life they want it. Maybe that's getting out of the rat race, right? So I hate my job. I hate my job. I hate my job. Why do I hate my job? Why do I want to get out of it? Maybe my best friend had a serious illness and had to face a life-threatening situation. Maybe they even passed away. And I'm like, that is not going to be my life. But I'm still sitting in my chair. And that's not enough. It's not enough. You, got, you have to take that very powerful why you want to do something different and turn it into action. And that is when the hows will materialize. That is, it's actually when the who's will materialize. And I'd hazard to say that it's generally comfort that keeps people there and that they need to get themselves uncomfortable. And whether that means surrounding yourself with people who are playing the game at a higher level or attending a, an event and being inspired and, and finding someone that you, you connect with well that can keep you accountable, just something like that. But comfort is the enemy of success. 
Yeah. So I love the who technique because it paints a picture of the future for me, you know? So all of a sudden what seemed insurmountable becomes possible. Uh, One of the techniques that I, I teach people in the courses is something called sampling. And so the brain has one primary goal and that is to keep you alive. And so what the brain wants to do is whatever you did yesterday, because the brain is thinking, hey, that must have worked because we're still here today. So let's not go crazy and do something totally different. And that's wonderful in many respects, but it can be debilitating in many respects also. And so the way to use the power of your brain and at the same time use it to actually move in these new directions you want to go is by sampling. And the very, very simple example of this is I assume they do this other places around the world, but here in the US, like you sometimes go into the grocery store and there's a person there with like a tray of cheese or crackers or whatever they're they're trying to sell that day. Do you guys have that where you are? Yeah, we do, yes. Awesome. So what is the size of the item on the tray? A tiny cube, yes. generally. Exactly, right? Tiny little cube. And so there's very little at stake for you to try that tiny little cube, right? And do they charge you for the cube? No. Of course not, right? It's free and it's small. So if you don't like it, and there's usually a waste paper basket there. So if it's really not that good, you can spit into the napkin and throw it out. And that is sampling. And the reason they sample like that is because if you like it, you're going to buy it. And if you buy it, do you buy the same tiny little cube? (laughs) No. (laughs) No way, right? They're like, hey, that thing you just sampled here, it comes in a four pound block, right? And so this brilliance of the supermarket worlds can be applied to our lives. And here's how you apply it to your life. So let's say that you said, I want to escape the rat race. And the big five for life items on my list, once I've escaped the rat race, are I want to go sail around the world for six months. I promise you that if on day one, you sell everything you own and you go buy a sailboat, that is fraught with disaster because your brain is not ready for that. But here's a path that will get your brain totally on board and guarantee you success. And that is, I tell people for the first three weeks that they've shared that dream with me, I want you to do nothing except spend five minutes a day, not more than five minutes a day, just five minutes a day on something that involves you watching or reading something about sailing. And they look at me like, I'm nuts, Christian. Like, what do you mean five minutes a day? Like what? Five five minutes a day. So then I quiz them. I'm like, because you got to get the brain moving, right? You say, so where could you watch something about sailing? YouTube. Perfect, right? Where could you read something about sailing? Uh, Magazine. Excellent. And here's what's happened. So let's say they flip open the magazine. And and that, of course, a sailing magazine is going to have like a gazillion pictures of beautiful boats and beautiful places, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is they open that magazine and they look at that boat and they see the ocean. And all of a sudden, their brain goes, ocean. Hey, we like the ocean. Okay, that's good. And then their brain goes, hey, look at that boat. There's, there's people on the boat. We're a person. Wait a minute, maybe we could do that. And so unconsciously what starts to happen is all of these synaptic connections start to form in your brain, which are in alignment with the dream as opposed to putting up the barrier to the dream because we don't want to die. And so after the three weeks are up, I say to them, okay, how was it? And they're like, oh, that's amazing. I, I, why won't you let me do more than five minutes, right? I, I could have sat and watched these YouTube videos. I could have flipped that magazine for like an hour every night, five minutes. Well, now what have I created for their brain? I've created demand. The brain is demanding more of that experience as opposed to putting up the wall that says, I can't deal with that. And so slowly over time, over the course of like a month and a half, you stretch it out from five minutes a day right? And eventually you give someone the chance. And they laugh when I tell them this, but it's so true. I say, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get onto the harbor. I want you to get onto the docks. Under no circumstances are you allowed to get on a boat. Under no circumstances. (laughs) All right. And they're like, what? I'm like, I'm not kidding. I am your coach under no circumstances. You come back to me and tell me you got in a boat. We're done. We're not working together anymore. Okay. All right. They go down to the docks right? They're walking the docks, these beautiful boats. They start talking to people. And of course, what do you think a sailor, right? Someone else who loves sailing, when you start telling me, yeah, my dream is to sail around the world for six months and you're standing right next to their boat, what do you think they're going to invite you to do? Well, they might just say, hey, you want to jump on board and have a look around? Yeah, like everybody, right? Because when you love something, you can't wait to invite other people to your party because you know how much it means to you. And so now here they are down at the docks, right? The boats are there. The people are all friendly and they're telling you these amazing stories and they're like, come on board. And your brain is like, dude, let me get on board. 
and you can't, right? You're saying no to your brain. What I have just enabled that person to do is to create insatiable demand on the part of their brain. Their brain is demanding that we do this thing that we want to do. And so the very, the very next week after that, after they come back, I'm like, awesome, it's time to go sailing. This is such a simple way to enable any person to go from, I want to do my dream, but it just doesn't seem to be happening, to this thing is moving faster than I could possibly even have imagined. In relation, I guess, to anyone listening now who's in that position where they're sat behind their desk or maybe on the bus or in their car, stuck in a traffic jam on the way to work at the moment, and they're uninspired, they're unfulfilled, they know that there's a a bigger calling out there for them. In terms of what you've just shared with us there, John, what would be your advice for that person who's really kind of maybe letting fear kind of hold them back and they're just not quite sure on those next steps? I think the first barrier to people is they aren't actually clear what the next step is. So they know that they're unhappy, which is great. People laugh when I say that, but there's this great Buddhist expression, dissatisfaction is the first step to enlightenment. If you weren't dissatisfied in your current state, you wouldn't change it to go to your new state, right? And so if you're dissatisfied in your current environments, be it the job that you have, the relationship you're in, where you're living, whatever the case is, if you're dissatisfied in that, that's awesome. That's the first step to freedom. And the next step is to know where you want to go. In the absence of actually knowing where you want to go, then my recommendation is start crossing things off your activity list that do not make you happy. And so sometimes what we need to do is to open up space and our lives can be so filled and they're filled with the things that are not in alignment with our big five for life, even if we don't know what those are yet, that we can't even fathom figuring out our big five for life. And so just opening up that space can be a great first step. And some people get uncomfortable with that, especially in today's day and age where with our smartphones, we sit at the traffic light and feel like we have to check our email. So it's sitting in silence a little bit and letting the opportunities start to manifest. If you know that you are ready, right? So you've crossed off that space and your whole energy, your whole spirit is telling you, I'm ready. You can take the steps to try and figure it out on your own, right? And I always start with people's interests. So, okay, what do you like to do on the weekend when you're not working at that job that you're not happy about? Those are great clues. Your hobbies are your clues to the way in which you would spend your, the majority of your time if you didn't have to go to the job. I firmly believe at this point in my life that my path to success is rapidly accelerated by working with someone who can get me there faster. You talked about this before. As an athlete, it's unbelievable. A coach can pick up. I'm a, I, I tried to make it for a long time as a professional beach volleyball player, two man. I still play. A coach can pick up something in five seconds that I can't see in myself because I can't see myself, you know? (laughs) And so my take would be, if you want to accelerate this whole process, then work with someone who can help you figure out your big five for life. If, If it's a different terminology that works for you, great, you know? But work with someone who can help you get clear on those five things that you most want to do to your experience so that you know your true north and you know where you want to allocate all of your resources, your time, your energy, your financial resources. Once you've got that, then it's a matter of doing what we just talked about. It's a matter of sampling. It's a matter of meeting the right who's, drawing the line in the sand and saying, I'm actually taking action and starting to make it a reality. And again, like once you get to the hardest thing is the figuring out, this is what I want to do to your experience. Once you know that and you start taking action, it really does like, man, it happens fast. John, I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today and with myself. I can't believe how quickly the time has flown by. <laughs> I know, like I really, just got started or an hour in. I feel that we could go on for, for at least another couple of hours. We're, we're just warming up here, but unfortunately, we are getting towards the end of our time together. And I want to end our conversation today by asking you, John, what do you want your legacy to be? On a very personal front, I want my legacy to be that I was the most amazing dad ever. I became a father almost 10 years ago, and I had no specific like inclination. Like I didn't, I didn't have that paternal thing. You know, like some people are like, gosh, I can't wait to be a parent. I didn't have that. But I will tell you that being a parent has been the greatest experience of my life. And it is not for everyone by any stretch, right? Just like traveling the world is not for everyone. It is for some of us. Being a parent is for some people. But for me, the opportunity to to be dad is the greatest thing ever. I love my daughter in ways that I never imagined it was possible to love another person. I'm so proud of her for the amazing person she is, the amazing things that she does, the insights she shares with me. And so I want my legacy to be that I was the greatest dad ever first. In addition to that, one of the concepts that I introduced in the Big Five for Life book was something called the Museum Day. 
there's actually a really cool, if you haven't seen it, Christian, I'll send you the link. I worked with a filmmaker to create a four minute version of this concept so people can see it visually. But the idea is that what if every moment of your life was recorded and everything you did, everything you said, the ways you spent your time, who you spent your time with. And at the end of your life, a museum was built to honor you. Only your museum would show your life exactly how you lived it. And so if you spent 70% of your awake life at a job that you hated, right, that would be your museum. And if for whatever reason, you only spent just a couple of percentages of your life on the things that you love, then only a couple of percentages of your museum would be dedicated towards that. And imagine if the afterlife or heaven or however you perceive this whole life experience to work actually consists of us being our own tour guide for our own museum for all of eternity. And so I hope that my legacy is that I have helped people fill their museum in ways that they would love to walk, not just for a day, not just for a week, not just for a month, but they would love to walk and relive and re-experience for all of eternity. That would be a pretty spectacular legacy. John, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all of your, your wisdom, your experiences, and I really, really wish you all the very best in the future with everything that you have and all of the amazing things which are still to come. If people want to get in touch with you, John, which I'm sure they will do, what's the best way for them to connect with you online? Because I have presences in multiple countries, it kind of depends on where the listener is. And so the best way is really to Google me. So just Google John Strolecki. And depending on your language, it's going to either direct you to one of the sites in Germany or the Netherlands or in French, or it's going to help you find one of my sites in English. And so there's, you know, there's bigfiveforlife.com. That's probably, if you're looking for the, an English site, that's an easy way to get in touch with me. Awesome. John, thanks so much for being a guest on Escape the Rat Race Radio. And I wish you all the very best in the future. And I hope to see you in the UK sometime. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to I want to close it out by thanking you, not just for inviting me to the show, but also for doing what you do. Because as I said earlier, you know, if, if I'd have known the things that I know now back when I was that kid at 12 or 20 or even in 25, it would have accelerated my progress so much. And by you taking the time to do what you do, you are the person who is changing those lives and so with heavy gratitude say thank you for what you do john that means a lot thank you and uh we'll connect in the very near future if not in person we'll do this again indeed i'm looking forward to it all right thanks christian thanks john see ya well that concludes my interview with john strelecki the american author known for books such as the y cafe and big five for life if you haven't read any of john's material yet i hope that that interview has inspired you now to go and grab a copy it really really did change the way that I looked at my life and really defining the important things where if you got to the end of your time and you look back and you said I managed to do those things that you would have a fulfilled life decide what those five things are for you go and grab a copy of the big five for life and check out some of John's training online to help you get clear about that process So as always, if you enjoyed my conversation today, please do head over to iTunes and leave me a positive review. It's really helpful for others to become aware of Escape the Rat Race and to spread the good word amongst all these people. So I'm going to sign off and wish you well for another week and I'll catch you in two weeks time. See ya. 